I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker, who is Eileen Christ. She's a professor in the Department of Science and Technology in Society at Virginia Tech. She received her PhD in sociology from BU and is co-editor of Gaia and Turmoil, Climate Change, Biodepletion, and Earth Ethics in an Age of Crisis. She's also co-editor of Keeping the Wild Against Domestication of the Earth. She'll be speaking to us today on confronting anthropocentrism. Thank you so much and welcome Eileen. Hello everyone. It's really nice to be here. Okay, I'm gonna start out um, with a news story that I think is very fitting for this gathering. A 2013 article called RoboChop in The Economist reported a problem. Tons of jellyfish clogging the pipes of a nuclear power plant forced it to shut down. And the article also reported a solution, the deployment of a fleet of killer robots that turn jellyfish into mush. These devices follow a lead robot and work in formation. They can chop up to 900 kilograms of jellyfish an hour. Now, so here's the question about this report. Isn't there something deeply disturbing about it? My talk is on anthropocentrism, and I'll circle back to make the connection between my topic and this report. I focus specifically on anthropocentrism, the anthropocentrism of Western culture, because this is the culture that is dominating the globe. A couple of qualifications on this point. Anthropocentrism is not necessarily a monopoly of Western culture, and there have been intellectual currents within the West that have opposed it. I will briefly touch on the questions. What is anthropocentrism? Why is it important to scrutinize? What does it do to the world and to humanity? Are we confronting it? And what possibilities open once we abandon anthropocentrism? I'm going to start with the question of why it's important to scrutinize. In facing the immense problems we've created, we encounter a notion that the overreaching power of humanity comes from our nature, from our species essence. And there are negative and positive versions of this belief. The negative version goes something like this. Well, we are greedy and selfish and aggressive by nature. Or along the same lines, the human impact is just an expression of a Darwinian process. Like any multiplying species with nothing to check our growth, we're just over-exploiting our environments. The positive version of human impact is coming from our nature goes something like this. Well, we are, after all, special. We're, we're kind of godlike. But so far, we've been like reckless gods. So we need to get good at being god. And we need to use our science, our technology, and our managerial skills to put our problems behind us and then get on with our great species destiny. Now, directing the spotlight on anthropocentrism leads us away from the pitfalls of both these views about human nature. The pitfall of the negative view is just shrugging our shoulders in the face of the human impact and letting nature, nature red in tooth and claw, just take its inevitable course. The pitfall of the positive view is the invitation to embrace the colonization of the planet and the domination of nature as humanity's manifest destiny. But anthropocentrism shifts the discussion away from human nature to the far more relevant issue of the cultural conditioning of the human. Because anthropocentrism or human supremacy, and I use these two terms interchangeably, is the cultural conditioning into the belief that humans are superior to all other life forms and entitled to use them. In our time, human supremacy manifests as three invisible widespread beliefs. That Earth belongs to humanity, that the planet consists in resources for the betterment of people, and that human beings are obviously superior to all other species. These beliefs are invisible in the sense that they are rarely, if ever, explicitly stated. But they can be discerned as the underlying assumptions according to which people act in the biosphere. 
The invisible operation of this belief system is a consequence of a long history of anthropocentrism, a history that reaches back to classical antiquity and has its roots in the birth of civilization. And we are the inheritors of this history. Our impact on nature stems from this legacy and not from demonic flaws or godlike attributes of our nature. To look at the legacy of anthropocentrism is to look at who and what has been displaced to the periphery. And that has been wild non-humans, indigenous people or so-called uncivilized people, and wild nature overall. The displacements can be grouped in two broad categories. They are the ideational displacements that involve belittling ideas about non-humans, about so-called savages and the wild, ideas that have enjoyed cultural preeminence. And then there are the physical displacements that have to do with geographical conquests that have exterminated and dislocated others. The ideational displacements are tied to a leading motif in Western thought, to contemplate the phenomenon of the human by posing the question, how are humans different from other species? Different, capital D. John Rodman summarized this key question as the differential imperative, described as the proclivity for isolating the distinguishing characteristics of humans from all other life forms. There has been no shortage of proposed distinguishing attributes. Reason, language, morality, civilization, technology, free will, etc. These have been offered and offered again and again as human distinctions. And such distinctions have been foundational for hierarchical narratives about life. Probably the most enduring of these stories threading through very different traditions of thought has been the great chain of being, with man at the top, minerals at the bottom, and we all know how to fill the space between. This hierarchical order has not only been about the nature of being, what philosophers call ontology, but it has also been a moral order, sanctioning man's use of everything beneath him. The physical displacements we are keenly familiar with before the civilized conqueror, forests have given way, and so have grasslands and wetlands, and rivers and lakes, and more recently the seas. Wild animals have been killed, enslaved, forced to remote areas, and driven to regional or total extinctions. Indigenous people have been labeled as savages or as animals and endured genocides and subjugations. Now, the ideational displacements, these cognitive belittlements of others, and the physical displacements have worked closely together. Anthropocentrism is, is not just a worldview. It's not just a picture of how things are. It is a lived worldview, a perspective that has carved the very world we inhabit, both mentally and physically. For a snapshot of what that worldview is capable of, we might think of the 19th century takeover of the American Plains. Neither supremacist ideas nor technological power, guns and plows alone, can explain the brutality with which the buffalo, the plains people, and the grasslands were treated. But the alliance between the superiority complex and the technical prowess of the civilized conqueror this lived world view of human supremacy sheds light on so many crimes committed against the living world. Okay, so I've talked about the displacements of anthropocentrism, and now I want to go to the question of what does it do to human beings who come under its spell? And I'm gonna to touch on two consequences for humanity. One, the inability to discern any reason for limiting expansionism, and two, becoming blindsided to the loss of the planet's richness and beauty. On the first point, the wisdom of limitations belongs to cultures that respect their non-human and human neighbors. It is that respect that gives rise to restraint. But the worldview of human supremacy 
In that worldview, respect for neighbors and their homes is extinguished by disparaging beliefs. Either they do not morally count, or they are inferior, or they are nothing but resources. So the conditioning of the human into a culture that is superior and entitled precludes the arising of restraint that comes from respect, from caring, and from a desire to fit in rather than take over. So nonstop expansionism is effectively built into human supremacy. Today, this absence of limitations, of, of restraint, is rampant all around us. It has become a kind of madness. We see it in the normalized violence of factory farms, the trashing and depletion of the seas, the drive to dam the rivers of the world, the rendition of whole landscapes in pursuit of fossil fuels, the trading of rainforests for plantations and pasture. We see the inability to countenance restraint even in the defiance of the number 350 parts per million. Civilization seems unable to halt its expansionism even in the face of its own potential demise. So beyond the inability to, to discern any reason for limitation, humanity has also blindsided itself to the loss of so much of the natural world. And here a sentence from the writing of Horkheimer and Adorno speaks to this point. They write, men pay for the increase in power with alienation from that over which they exercise power and how true this statement is about human relationships, and not least about the relationship between humanity and nature. A phenomenon broadly indicative of this alienation is the shifting ecological baseline. With each generation, ecological impoverishment increases, but each generation takes that impoverished condition as normal. Since wild beings have not been neighbors, neither their presence nor their disappearance has, for the most part, warranted recording. Amnesia about the living world is the existential condition that we have reached in exchange for the supremacist exercise of power. Another pinnacle of alienation from the biosphere today is the ongoing invisibility of the mass extinction episode underway. Mass extinction remains publicly largely unknown, little understood, and rarely talked about. Okay, so I've touched on what human supremacy does to civilized humanity, disabling limitations and blinding people to the loss of life. Even so today, there is something new happening, a dawning recognition of the mounting and dangerous side effects of expanding civilization. So there's a sense of big trouble coming our way. What is the prevalent response? Has it been to confront the historical legacy of human supremacy? Its displacements, extinctions, lack of restraint, alienation from the living world, and ecological amnesia? Not to date. No mainstream politician, media, or NGO has confronted the anthropocentric worldview. Instead, the prevailing response to ecological challenges has been a riff on the human supremacist storyline. We are the resourceful race. We're the technological magicians, the god species. These are the kind of exhortations we hear nowadays. So in this vein, the standard approach to solving problems is piecemeal and technological. And I'll give you a couple of um, uh, high-profile examples of that. Shortages of fresh water will be tackled with desalinization or by redirecting entire rivers. Diminishing fossil fuels will be countered with extreme technologies that extract from deep sediments, from mountaintops, and from deforested landscapes. Down the road, algae or switchgrass or some kind of biomass will be repurposed for fuel. If climate disruption gets out of hand, well, maybe geoengineering will, will save the day. Adequate food 
that will be secured by genetically engineering crops and animals. If wild fish become depleted, well, we can just escalate our fish factories. And to circle back to the beginning, when jellyfish clog up our pipes, well, we'll just invent high-tech robots and cut them into bits. Never mind that the jellyfish blooms everywhere in the oceans are a consequence of what we have been doing to the oceans. So when we consider all these approaches as a whole, and we think of them as, a, as examples of a single framework, we can apprehend that the framework keeps the spotlight on human ingenuity to solve the problems. And it even invites admiration for that ingenuity. Most importantly, the piecemeal technological framework avoids challenging human expansionism. But on the contrary, it wants to make human dominion sustainable. Namely, that the Earth belongs to humanity, that the planet consists in resources, and that humans are obviously superior and entitled vis-a-vis -vis all other species. So here I will close by raising but not answering the question, what possibilities open if we choose to abandon anthropocentrism and create a new worldview and a new civilization? Namely, that Earth is a community of unique beings, places, and cultures that the planet, inhabited with restraint, is abundant for our material sustenance and ravishing for our spirit, and that the natural world abounds in diverse forms of intelligence and awareness. Thank you.